Hi and welcome back to a new video. It seems like people finally found a reason again to get the pitchforks out for the RTX 3080 and 3090. We have the cap issue, means that, I mean, you probably followed everything from Jace to Sense, from Igor's lab, from Bullseuds. I'm not going to go through all of this again. To sum it up quickly, on the back side of the GPU, you have those bypass caps and depending on your capacitor selection, then they're better or worse feeding their energy to the GPU if the GPU needs it and those small MLCCs are better than the bigger SP or POS caps. That's what the current state of knowledge is. And for me, it makes sense on a technical level. But the question for me is, how much of an issue is it? Because I tested several 3080, 3090s. I didn't have any instability issues on stock. Obviously, when you're overclocking, you always hit a mark somewhere where the individual GPU is getting unstable. And this, from my experience, was somewhere between 1960 to 2080 megahertz, depending on your individual GPU. And over the previous years, I also did some capacitor mods where we replaced capacitors or added additional capacitors to cards to improve this situation. And usually when we did that, it yielded in like 20 to 40 megahertz, but not like 100 or 200 megahertz, which seems to be something people are expecting at the current situation. A lot of people are thinking that this two gigahertz mark can only be breached by having a ton of MLCC caps, but then looking at my RTX 3080 Tough Gaming, which has only MLCCs, it's not a golden clocker. It clocks out at two gigahertz, but pushing it to 2.1, you need like volt mod and shunt mod and everything. So it seems not to be that easy. But the question is, what happens if you have a card like this, the gigabyte card, which is using six POS caps, SP caps, and then we're replacing two of them with MLCCs. I have 47 microfarad capacitors laying around here, which I'm using for my cap mods. Just simply going to replace two of them and then we're seeing if it makes a difference or not. But first of all, let's check out the stock situation, stock clocks, if it's any issue, and also what the current OC limit of this card is. This video is powered by Team Group with their new T-Force Vulkan SSDs and the Extreme ARGB DDR4 gaming memory kits. The T-Force Vulkan SATA SSDs are available from 250GB to 1TB 3D NAND capacity and offer up to 560MB per second transfer speed. The very thin chassis with only 7mm height, ECC, trim and smart turned this into a great option for your laptop or gaming PC. The T-Force Extreme ARGB memory kits with 3200, 3600 and 4GHz offer a very high transfer speed and at a same time unique design. The most recent generation of ARGB LEDs paired with an aluminium heatsink with mirror finish are compatible with RGB software of Asus, MSI, Gigabyte and ASRock. Find out more in the link below. For the first test the card is just running a moderate OC but the fans and everything else are just stock caps are also still stock on the backside of the GPU. That is my usual test scenario, just running 3D Mark Times by Extreme GT1 in 1440p looped test. That means that this test is just running forever. It's quite nice to use as a stability test because you can run it in window mode and keep open GPU-C or GPU tweak at the same time and test out your graphics card. For the base test, I have the power target adjusted to 105% TDP, GPU temperature target at 91 degrees Celsius and plus 70 megahertz OC on the GPU. That is the max stable I can run this card for. Now if I increase the clock just minimal by 10 megahertz to plus 80, that is not stable. It will crash at a certain point. Let's check what happens to the clock when it crashes. And now it indeed crashed and at the crash we had a spike of about 2070 megahertz. And that's the data from the GPU-Z log file. You can see all the time it's about 1900 megahertz on the GPU core until that is the crash moment. It's 1.5 seconds at just yeah, 2.05 gigahertz on the card. And then it's resetting the driver. That is this moment with 420. And then, yeah, it's just going back quickly into 3D state at 1755, which is the stock clock and then resetting because it's not in 3D mode anymore. And that's exactly what's happening in GPU-Z. There we have the card I was talking about the Gigabyte RDX 3090 with the six big caps on the back. We will replace the two in the middle, so the one on top and the one on the bottom, I will remove and replace with those tiny 0805 resistors. Just as comparison, yeah, pretty small, about 1.2 millimeter wide and like 2.2 millimeter long, 47 microfarad, that's 
probably the biggest size you can get for those type of caps. You can see the marking on the big capacitor is reading 470 microfarad, which means if we replace the bottom and the top one with 10 capacitors each of the small MLCCs, then it should be the same capacity, just a different case and a different type of capacitor. And the big one also has a set polarity, which can be identified by this marking on top, by this line. Those tiny ones, the MLCCs, they don't have a set polarity. First step is just mainly protecting the card with the captain tape around the area where we're going to solder. The captain tape is very high temperature resistant tape and will just protect the card. I don't know, like let's say some soldering tin will drop on the card and then it just makes it a lot more convenient and easier to handle, not to break things. And in the first step I'm going to heat up the whole card with a heat gun also to make soldering easier. If the card has a base temperature of like 100 degrees Celsius, soldering will be much easier. Both of the big capacitors cleaned the solder pads. Looks quite good to me. First step is reassembly and test if this even affects anything. Just removing the two capacitors. The first quick test was more impressive than I thought. It's the same setting as previously. Same clock settings, power target, GPU target. But the test wouldn't even run one minute. It crashed directly after one minute, while previously it would pass over one hour. Just to be safe, I'm going to repeat the test a second time. Same settings as before. And let's see what happens. Yeah, not even, not even 30 seconds and it crashed a second time. There's definitely a bigger influence to this than I thought. All right, not bad. Just one hour later, roughly. Keep in mind, I'm not a pick and place machine and it just has to work. It's not beautiful. Some of them are also kind of attached together, soldered together, which is fine because the pads underneath are also connected and it just made it a little bit easier for me. Last thing to check is if there is no short circuit. I kept checking it in between, but one final check before we mount the block. First checking ground to ground and then Ground to VGPU, 0 0.9 and 0 0.7, 0 0.6. Yeah, that should be fine. It's only a very tiny difference on GPU resistance, but 0 0.7 to 0 0.9, yeah, that should be it. Back to the start, GPU boost plus 70 power target, 105 GPU temperature target, 91 degrees Celsius. That was the initial maximum stable overclock which I could run on this card with the stock capacitors. And after we removed the big ones, this crashed after like 30 seconds or like one minute. And now it has been running for over 25 minutes. That is looking promising. I think we can skip this step and now check what happens if we go in the region of plus 80, plus 90, maybe plus 100. Adjusted the GPU clock to plus 100. Let's see if we can validate this faster and easier than before. I just showed it in a German video that plus 100 was running stable for like 10 minutes. You can see it right here. But changing to like plus 120 boosted up to yeah 2100 at the point where it crashed. And that's it. Like plus 100 was stable but plus 120 is not stable. To sum it up, it's pretty much as expected. On this card, it's an average clocker with 1900 megahertz. 
I could improve it by like 20, 30 megahertz and that's also what I would expect from simply replacing capacitors on the back of your PCB. I don't think that it's possible to get 100 or 200 megahertz more out of a card by simply replacing some capacitors on the back. I cannot recall any generation where you would have such a huge difference in boost simply by changing to a little bit better spec capacitors that would be absolutely surprising. Obviously the whole boost drama is more an issue of Nvidia giving the partners not enough time to evaluate their BIOS or they are not testing their products well enough because if they would have figured out after like a week that their current boost setting is unstable and they need like 20 megahertz less boost there wouldn't have been a drama right but the question is is it the capacitor which is to blame or is it more like the BIOS is boosting too high in the first place I think it's a combination of both but if the partners would have more time to test everything it would have been much better but it's just the same thing which we see at every single launch it doesn't matter if it's if it's Nvidia with the 30 generation if it's AMD with graphics cards they usually have a lot of driver issues then you have drama on AMD motherboards with boost and you have drama with Intel stuff Every single vendor these days is testing on the consumer, which is obvious. And if you're the early adopter getting the stuff on the first day, yeah, you're always the guy testing things for the manufacturer because obviously they didn't have enough time to test those things because a launch is rushed. There was zero availability in the cards. I guess Nvidia is to blame, but I don't think it's a huge issue on those cards, especially if you're not overclocking, not sure. And also keep in mind, you always have to see the full picture. Let's say at launch you're selling 1000 graphics cards and then 20 people experience instability, which is just 2%, but those 20 people can make a lot of noise and the other 980 people, they're just happily gaming and they don't care. And then you usually get a very wrong impression easily and that is always something you have to keep in mind especially when the hardware is very fresh in the market it's the same with the 20 generation when at the beginning everybody was reporting oh my god all the 20 series gpus are dying because some gpus died at the start but do you hear a lot of this after months and like a year like how many died is it the 60% people were saying at the start i don't think so all right enough for this video thanks for joining in see you next time bye bye